This is the second uh, session, and uh, the title of the session is uh, Political Uses of Denial. And we have three speakers, Jennifer Dixon, Alex Hinton, and Mark Gottlieb. This will be the order that they are going to talk. And uh, the first speaker, Jennifer, she is assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Villanova University. And our second speaker, Alex Hinton, is the director of the Center for Study of Genocide and Human Rights and professor of anthropology and global affairs at Rutgers University, New York. And Paul, I read this also, it's important, Paul, the UNESCO Chair in Genocide Prevention. And our third spe speaker, Mark Gottlieb, is the Executive Director of the Public Health Advocacy Institute at Northeastern University School of Law. So each speaker, approximately 15 minutes time. So, Jennifer, so. Political scientist, so my research is going to be perhaps a little bit different from some of the other papers that are presented on the panel and on the other panels. My broader research focuses on uh, states that have committed mass atrocities and the narratives that those states Sorry. construct, and specifically when and why they change their narratives. Um, and so I focus in my research on Turkey's narrative of the Armenian Genocide, or um, as it's called in Turkey, more often the Armenian question of the Emily Sorada. And um, I also focus on Japan's narrative of the Nanjing Massacre. Um, so this paper is just going to focus on uh, Turkey's narrative of the Armenian Genocide. Um, and since most of the other, some of the other papers have already talked about uh, the Armenian Genocide, I'm not going to give you a background of the Armenian Genocide. Can you hear me? Um, okay, so uh, one thing that I do want to say, which some of you might already know, is that from very soon after the genocide, uh, Turkish Ottoman authorities and the Turkish authorities in particular um, started to silence um, stories about the genocide and started to um, actively suppress discussion of the issue within the public sphere um, from the early 1920s, um, if not before that. So strands of, of the narrative that we, that we are um, familiar with today really had their origins in the period of the genocide and the immediate aftermath of the genocide. And so there was really a narrative that one would, could characterize primarily as one of silence up until um, the late 1970s, um, which is remarkable, um, that, that, that there was such a period of active silence. It was not a, a passive silence, but an active silencing. Um, and what I want to talk about today, though, is that um, when a narrative emerged in the early 1980s, um, since then, there has been a, a striking degree of continuity in the state's fundamental position. And in particular, there's been um, continuity in the fundamental rejection of um, intentionality and responsibility for um, the systematic destruction of Ottoman Armenians. And yet alongside that continuity, there have been, um, there have been a number of changes, um, some subtle, some less subtle. Um, and in particular, what I want to focus on today is uh, changing rhetorical argumentation vis-a-vis -vis, um, salient international norms. And, and in thinking about genocide, and in particular thinking about a genocide that happened long ago in the past, there's really two dominant international norms that we can talk about. There's the norm against genocide, which was obviously codified in the immediate aftermath of World War II, and then there's the norm of accountability, or people call it by different names, transitional justice, um, truth commissions, truth telling, truth seeking, it's got a bunch of different names. Um, and this norm is a more recent norm. Um, that emerged and has changed shape um, really since uh, starting from um, the 1980s and then really um, starting to accelerate and, and um, be institutionalized in the wake of uh, South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and what's interesting about Turkey's narrative is that over time, despite this continuity in the baseline position of, um, of the rejection of intentionality, um, and of responsibility, that there's been shifting argumentation vis-a-vis -vis the concept of genocide and vis-a-vis -vis this idea of accountability. And there's really been three trends that I want to talk about. So one is that uh, the, the concept of genocide has not, perhaps contrary to your impression, 
been a part of the state's narrative uh, for the whole period since the genocide. It's actually, it was added to and became a part of the state's narrative in the early 1980s and um, has become a more fundamental and core part of the state's narrative, this rejection of the term genocide over time. So that's an interesting evolution. Another one is that um, as Turkish officials have focused more and more on this concept of genocide, um, their argumentation about why what happened to Ottoman Armenians wasn't genocide has also shifted. So that the argumentation um, against the label of genocide has not been consistent. And as I'll argue, it's changed in parallel with shifting understandings of genocide itself internationally. And then the last thing I want to say is that as um, expectations of truth-telling have changed, so as this norm of accountability has emerged and has broadened and has become more institutionalized internationally, um, Turkish officials have, in really remarkable ways, um, drawn on this norm and um, embedded elements of these expectations related to this norm in the state's narrative and in the state's argumentation without actually changing any actions. Um, and so what I argue in my paper, and I'm going to, um, uh, the paper is really intended to contribute to international relations scholarship on norms. Um, since we're interested more in rhetoric and argumentation and denial here, I'm going to focus more on the rhetoric and argumentation. But in the paper, I introduce this concept of rhetorical adaptation, um, where I argue that, that uh, international relations scholars typically under, understand and talk about international norms as um, diffusing and being adopted by states and states adapting their behavior either in compliance with or not in compliance with international norms. And that states learn from norms and change their behaviors in good ways. And actually, um, states learn from norms and adapt to them and change their behaviors in response to those norms in ways that are fundamentally contrary to the content of those norms. Um, in, in many different instances. There's lots of examples that I give in the paper, but I focus in particular in the paper on, on an extended case study of Turkey's narrative because, um, because it, it, it offers a lot of fruitful examples of this. Um, and so here's my definition of what rhetorical adaptation is. So it's a process in which state actors shift their rhetoric in response to understandings of an international norm in order to either avoid charges of norm violation or to resist pressures for or expectations of norm compliance. And so um, just to highlight the importance of this, um, so Mark has already talked about, um, well, okay, the other thing, the other example I want to give Mark already talked about. Um, so I just want to give two examples where, um, that highlight the importance of actually having terms to refer to um, shifting argumentation vis-a-vis -vis international norms. Um, and that if we don't have this language, it becomes hard to disaggregate and better and, and actually understand um, the nature of rhetoric and, and, and what its implications actually are. Um, so um, on April 23rd, 2014, which is the day before the day on which the Armenian Genocide is commemorated annually, um, then Prime Minister um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan um, made a statement about the, what he referred to as the events of 1915, which is the, the, the now PC term on the part of the Turkish government for the Armenian Genocide. Um, and interestingly, uh, this statement was lauded as surprising, unprecedented, important um, by a number of media outlets, in particular a number of Western media outlets, in addition to um, Turkish media outlets. Um, and in fact, the statement was none of those things. Um, the statement was fundamentally consistent with um, Turkish rhetoric as it's been developed over, um, in particular, I would say, the past 10 years, um, and as it's been shaped to respond to, um, in particular, the norm of accountability. Um, and so I just want to highlight a couple of things um, that really resonate with international expectations about truth-telling and, quote-unquote, coming to terms with the past. That have, that have become core elements of the Turkish state's narrative and that were present in this statement on, on um, April 23rd. So, um, uh, Prime Minister er Erdogan says, it is a duty of humanity to acknowledge that Armenians remember the suffering experienced in that period. And then later on at the end, which was actually noted as the most remarkable part of the statement, was he said, we wish that the Armenians who lost their lives in the context of the early 20th century rest in peace 
and we convey our condolences to their grandchildren. So this phrase, we convey our condolences, was really the one that was picked up on as, you know, media outlets said, Prime Minister Erdogan expresses condolences to Armenians for, for Armenian genocide. And this was um, remarked as, as really notable. And in fact, it's not, um, at least in the context of the, of the state's official narrative. Um, the other thing is this, is this uh, European Court of Human Rights decision that Mark highlighted, and I actually have the same text up here that Mark had because the text is just so interesting. Um, but what I want to say is that this text actually, um, this decision on the part of the European Court of Human Rights highlights the effects of rhetorical adaptation. Um, which I'll come back to at the end of my talk, which is that um, by adapting one's rhetoric to international normative expectations, um, it renders rhetoric and it renders arguments more legitimate because they're normatively resonant and they're framed in the language um, that we uh, that, 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 that is that is deemed appropriate um, for certain actors in certain conditions. Um, and one might think that this that, that, that this sort of strategy would be. Um, would fall flat, um, but in fact, it can be quite powerful and can have strong effects, very much because the language um, is legitimate language, or it appears to be legitimate language and to be consistent with international norms. And in this case, um, I, which I think was a truly remarkable decision, the European Court, Court of Human Rights um, argued not only that, so they, which is true, genocide is, genocide is a concept that he, they said that has a very precise definition, that's true. Um, but then they went on to say that it's difficult to substantiate. Um, they said that the Armenian genocide, in their opinion, didn't, didn't, um, didn't meet the, 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 the demands of this definition, which is inconsistent with a huge, large body of historical scholarship. Um, but more fascinatingly, I would say, they went on to say that they didn't think that it was possible um, to perhaps conclude that any event fits this very difficult to substantiate and very precisely defined definition of genocide. Um, but then they really quickly assured us that the Holocaust did fit this very difficult to define concept of genocide. And here, as I'm going to demonstrate, this, this, this is a reflection of um, really, really um, interesting uh, and powerful rhetorical adaptations that have um, attempted to shift and manipulate understandings of the concept of genocide. And I would say here we see an effect of these attempts to, to reframe what genocide means. Um, so in my paper, I identify a few different types of rhetorical adaptation. Um, and now because I've talked a lot, I'm going to go somewhat quickly over some of them. Um, I, ident I identify four different types of rhetorical adaptation. So the first one is norm disregard. So that's basically um, a norm is relevant to certain actions. Um, and the, because the norm isn't so powerful, the state um, just doesn't say anything about it. Um, and so here, the best example of this is really in the early period of Turkey's narrative in the 50s and the 60s and 70s, where there was no mention of the concept of genocide. It was, it was absolutely absent. Um, and in fact, um, consistent with really the lack of expectations of truth-telling, so really the absence of a norm of accountability, Turkish officials argued that it was really best to leave this in the past. Um, so here, their rhetoric was resonant with with really two different sets of expectations, in a sense. Um, so the second type of rhetorical adaptation that I identified is um, is called norm avoidance. Um, so this is when uh, actors attempt to um, locate the actions or the motivations of the state outside the boundaries, the definitional boundaries or parameters of a given norm. Um, so it's redefining the actions or reframing the actions, not the norm itself. Um, so the example I have here of this is that um, in the 1980s, Mark uh, referenced Shukr Elikdal. Um, in the United States, Shukr Elikdal was the Turkish ambassador to the US for about a decade. And he was um, really, really involved in reframing, recharacterizing, and uh, uh, energizing defenses of Turkey's narrative throughout the 1980s. Um, and uh, one of the core arguments at the time, um, and that we see continuing today, is that the Ottoman state in 1915 was the scene of a civil war within a global war, a civil war stemming from an armed uprising of Armenians seeking to impose by force the establishment of an exclusively Armenian state in an area where the majority population was not Armenians. There are a number of statements like this in a whole variety of different publications. Um, and what we see here, why I call this norm avoidance, 
is because um, Turkish officials were arguing with this, that what, what happened in 1915, 1916, and 1917, that this wasn't genocide, this was civil war. Um, and so by being civil war, it, according to this argumentation, which is actually not consistent with scholarship on genocide, it, that located it outside the boundaries of genocide. Um, Yeah, so I'm just reading it to see what my other example is. The other example is more recent, um, is that uh, over time, as understandings of genocide have evolved, in particular as in the 1990s, um, a, a body of case law, um, international case law, in relation to genocide arose in response to or at, in the aftermath of the um, the atrocities and genocide in the um, Yugoslav wars and then also in the Rwandan genocide, um, uh, there was an increasing focus on international legal aspects of genocide. And Turkish officials paid close attention to that, and they shifted their argumentation to arguing that, um, that the Armenian genocide wasn't a genocide because it didn't fulfill certain key aspects, necessary elements of this international definition. So the argumentation shifted, but it shifted in line with shifting expe expectations or understandings of this concept of genocide. And so in particular, Turkish officials began to focus increasingly on, um, on intentionality and arguing that, that the Armenian genocide, uh, what we would call the Armenian genocide, wasn't a genocide because there was no intent to destroy. Um, and that it wasn't a systematic, calculated act on the part of the state. So this is saying, this, this, this fell outside our definition of genocide, so therefore it wasn't genocide. Um, the third thing I, I identify is norm interpretation, and this is this is where this is what has had the most profound effect um, it, it, that we see in the European Court of Human Rights um, decision, which is um, arguing not that the events of the state's actions fall outside the boundary of a norm, but rather that the norm is different than we might think it is. So it's an attempt to reframe or narrow the definition of the norm to therefore leave the state's actions outside the boundaries of the norm. So it's not changing the understanding of the state's actions, but of the norm itself. Um, and so the example that, that really exemplifies this type of rhetorical adaptation is the Turkish government's efforts, in particular in the 1980s, to argue that genocide was synonymous with and really limited to the Holocaust. Um, and this resonated with some understandings of genocide at the time, although in the early 1980s when this argument was developed, understandings of genocide were beginning to shift. So this is the point of time at which comparative genocide studies was beginning to emerge, and scholars were in particular beginning to compare the Holocaust with the Armenian genocide. And so Turkish officials were very concerned about this. This was not a good thing for Turkish officials. Um, and so they started to argue that genocide was Holocaust, and therefore the Armenian genocide wasn't genocide because it wasn't the Holocaust. Um, and so this redefined what genocide was. It narrowed the definition of genocide to a single case, and that the event had to look just like the Holocaust, and in fact had to be the Holocaust in order for it to be a genocide. Um, am I almost done? Okay. Um, the last thing I want to, uh, the last example of rhetorical adaptation is more signaling. So this is um, embedding elements of normative expectations in a state's rhetoric without actually changing behavior. So we might call this lip service, we might call this um, uh, cheap talk is a term um, I, international relations scholars would use to refer to something like this. And this is most evident, I would say, in the past 10 years of Turkish officials' rhetoric, where Turkish officials, as epitomized in, in Prime Minister, um, now President Erdogan's um, April 23rd statement, have um, have foregrounded um, statements of a commitment to dialogue, to facing the past, to um, seeking out truth, to, um, to uh, accepting um, the path, uh, the past, to facing history as a core part of the state's narrative. Um, and this is really, uh, not, this has not been paralleled by actual shifts in coverage of the genocide in textbooks, shifts in coverage of the genocide in government publications. This has not been paralleled by shifts in, in, um, in what the state says about the genocide. So this is, this is rhetoric at purely the rhetorical level. Um, so just to finish up, because Hannah said that my time is about out, um, I just want to 
mention two things. So, so what are the effects of this? You know, is this just what we might call empty rhetoric? Um, or does rhetoric like this, in particular uh, rhetoric framed in normatively resonant terms um, that I would argue gives it greater legitimacy, does it, does it matter? Um, and, and hopefully the examples at the beginning highlight that it does matter. Um, and I can, I'm happy to talk in the Q&A, um, that this rhetoric has, has had a number of different effects, um, both in terms of um, instrumentally gaining support from actors for, to support Turkey's position um, by giving those actors um, more legitimate arguments to make um, in support of the reasons why they're supporting Turkey's position, um, and has also, um, I would say, most um, surprisingly perhaps, um, led to the European Court of Human Rights decision, which, which actually threatens to change our understanding of, of what genocide actually is. I'll stop Thank there. you. Our second speaker, Alex Simpson, title is Hidden Genocide and the Politics of Memory in Cambodia. Yes, Alex. Oh, you have to wait. Sponsors and the co-organizers, uh, and uh, also Sarah Cushman as well. Um, I, I would list everyone and go on a long time saying my thanks, but I know that I'm on the clock, so I'm not going to do that. Um, I just want to briefly note that uh, you know I, I'm come in with the assumption, which is completely wrong. I realize at this point that people have read through the paper. It's a short paper, uh, but the presentation I'm giving is related but different, it speaks to the points of the paper in a very different way, but that's okay. So, uh, also, in terms of uh, more broadly, I've been working on this issue, but through the lens of uh, what we might call hidden genocides, and uh, at Center I Direct, we've had a couple of books that have come out, uh, one called Hidden, hidden Genocides, another one's about to come out, uh, Colonial Genocide in uh, Indigenous North America. So, the title of this presentation uh, is actually Ellipsis, the Tool Slaying Genocide Museum uh, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, and it is presented in a slightly different style, so please bear with me. Pause. Take a quick look. It's all that's needed. Count. One, two, three, begin. Ellipsis, the 2006 authoritative guide to the Tool Slaying Museum of Genocidal Crimes. Cross through the entrance, but watch out for the beggar. Avert your gaze. Half his face is melted away. He only has one eye. He wants your pity so he can get your money. Warning, he may still be there on the way out. Buy your ticket, take a brochure, but it isn't necessary to read it. The signs tell you what you need to know. Here's the first. Introduction to the Tool Sling Genocide Museum. In the past, Tool Slaying Museum was one of the secondary schools in the capital called Tool Spy Prey High School. After 17th April 1975, Paul Pop Click had transformed it into a prison called S21, Security Office 21, which was the biggest in Campuchia Democratic. It was surrounded by a double wall with corrugated iron, surrounded by dense barbed wire. The classrooms on the ground and the first floors were pierced and divided into individual cells, whereas the ones on the second floor used for mass detention. Several thousands of victims, peasants, workers, technicians, engineers, doctors, teachers, students, Buddhist monks, minister, Pol Pot's cadres, soldiers of all ranks, the Cambodian diplomatic corps, foreigners, etc., were imprisoned and exterminated with their wives and children. There are a lot of evidences here to proving the atrocities of the Pol Pot clique. Cells, instruments of torture, dossiers and documents, lists of prisoners' names, mugshots of victims, their clothes and their belongings. We founded the mass grave surrounding, and in particular, the most one situated 15 kilometers in the southwest of Phnom Penh, in the village of Chung Aik, District Dongkol, Kandal Province. 
There are French and Cambodian translations as well. The English translation is poor, but you get the point. Walk quickly along the pathway towards the first building, but be careful. Halfway down, the pavement turns to dirt and stone. A construction job is underway. One worker bends, his fingers sifting through a bucket of dirt. Another man squats in a ditch that extends down below the surface. He is looking intently at something below, but you won't be able to tell what's there. A wooden plank bars the path, prevents tourists from getting too close. A third man stands slightly behind the others. He is dressed entirely in black, like the butchers who worked here during the Pol Pot regime. But he wears a black baseball cap instead of the mal caps they used back then. Don't stare. Rest your gaze on him for a moment. Follow the slope of his shoulder. Notice that he's clenching a bludgeon, ready to smash. Crack open the surface so they can fix the damage hidden below. No need to worry. After they have finished, the gaps and rough patches that there were before will be gone, replaced by concrete, smooth and light gray. For a moment, you'll have to go off the path, make a brief detour and go around. Try not to step on the grass. It is already parched and browning in places. Get back on the path immediately. From there, you can see. The first building is approaching, three stories tall, its outside corridors dotted by blackened windows and doors. As you draw close, closer, you'll be able to, to make things out inside. Stop before you get there. Look at the small memorial area containing 14 raised white tombs. A sign explains the victim's grave. The 14 victim's corpses have been founded by the Army Forces of the Front Union Salvage National Cappuccia through Building A and carried its to bury in this place. Among those corpses, there was a woman victim. These victims were the last ones who had been killed by the agent of S-21 before their fugitive. Don't look at the three accompanying photos. They are graphic and will reappear. You might not be able to put them out of your mind. Building A, lower level, lower floor, 2006. Time to go. Head into the first building and step up into the corridor. Its tiled floor, checkered tan and white, two signs tell the story. The first provides an overview. Building A. It contains three stories divided into 20 cells. The first one has 10 cells used for jailing, interrogating, and torturing the prisoners who have been the high officials. The second and third ones have five big cells each used for the same purpose as on the first story. Nowadays, there are a lot of evidences remaining in all the cells, which prove the atrocities of the, of the Pol Pot clique. The second describes the security rules. The security of regulation. One, you must answer my questions. You must, accordingly, you must answer accordingly to my question. Don't turn them away. Two, don't try to hide the facts by making pretext this and that. You are strictly prohibited to contest me. Three, don't be a fool for you are a chap who dare to thwart the revolution. Four, you must immediately answer my questions without wasting time to reflect. Five, don't tell me either about your immoralities or the essence of the revolution. Six, while getting lashes or electrification, you must not cry at all. Seven, do nothing, sit still, and wait for my orders. If there is no order, keep quiet. When I ask you to do something, you must do it right away without protesting. Eight, don't make pretexts about Campuchia Crown in order to hide your secret or traitor. Nine, if you don't follow the rules above, you shall get many lashes of electric wire. 10, if you disobey at any point in my regulations, you shall get either 10 lashes or five shocks of electric discharge. You know enough. Go through the entrance of the first room. That's where the photograph hangs. Step through the door, pass within. There's only one thing in the room, an old metal lattice bed frame with a sign that reads, do not touch and block lettering. Look at the photograph on the wall. It's awful, a doubling from the past, a body that was there before, then gone,
now a trace framed in black and white. Below the corpse is a pool of blood. Look at the floor. Some of the tiles are still partly darkened, permanent stain. Look at the iron bed frame. Fill in the blank. No caption is needed. The picture says it all. What more proof do you need? You're looking at atrocity. Building B, mother and child. Take a breath. Inhale. Once, twice, three times. You're ready to go. There's no need to see more building A. Walk to the end of the corridor. You can glance into the rooms as you go, but you'll see the same thing. Grotesque, swollen corpses, victims. Move more quickly. We've only just begun, but we're already almost out of time. Skip the gallows. One glance at the image of the prisoner strung up in the air tells you all you need to know. Go to the first room. You'll pass by a sign that says no laughing. There are many photos, but few captions, all, most of which are in Khmer. No need. Atrocity speaks for itself. Don't stop. You aren't missing much. There are just some photographs and maps depicting the perpetrators and their brutal policies. Forced evacuations, slave labor, cadre with glare. But you should pause to look at the display of the victim's clothes. Tool slang is the Cambodian Auschwitz. Cross the passage that has been cut through the classroom walls. Do I need to say more? Look at the faces, row after row of victims, men, women, children, some have numbers affixed to their shirts. Some are bruised. All look scared. But there's one picture in particular I want you to see. You'll never forget it. All of the tour guides stop here. The young woman's eyes are glassy. She's dressed in black, hair cropped short. In her arms, she holds an infant. It's uncertain if the child is alive or dead. Stand close to the glass. Catch a glimpse of your own reflection. That is how the victims looked when they arrived at the prison, yelled at and beaten, disoriented, terrified, in chains, eyes covered by a blindfold, suddenly removed, bright light, dilating eyes, a flash, imprint, a face frozen in time, on a negative, reproduced, filed, later archived, put on these walls, criminal evidence, proof. You have already seen how things ended for them. First you go up First you got an after, now you get a before. Fill in the blanks, continue on, leave now. They won't stop staring. A scream, a cry, an accusation. Walk outside. You'll see a stairway at the end of the building. Walk up if you dare. You'll see an iron gate that's half open. A chain dangles from a thick lock, lock bolted to the wall on the other side. Down the corridor, the doors and shutters are closed. But at the other end, you can just make out dark tinted glass, the kind that lets you see out, not in. A sign hangs on the gate, sloping. In block letters, it reads, no entry. Leave, now. Building C, cell block, optional. Fill in the blanks, continue on. Time is short. Uh, excuse me. Time, <laughs> fill in the blanks. <laughs> Time is short. <laughs> um, oh, All right. Building C, cell block. Fill in the blanks. Continue on. Time is short, so walk quickly through building C. It's draped with barbed wire and has just one sign. Building C, ground floor, single cells made of brick. First floor, single cells made of wood. Second floor, mass detention. The braid of barbed wires prevents the desperate victim from committing suicide. Look at the rows of, of brick and mortar cells, the tiny space where prisoners were kept, relieving themselves into a plastic bottle or empty ammunition can as they starved. It's not necessary to go upstairs. It's the same except where it's not as bright as it is on the first floor, where you can see things more clearly. Up cells, the upstairs, the cells are small little spaces with wooden doors, but they better stay shut. No need to look inside. It's too dark. Skip it. Building D, 
Now, go to building D. Hurry. Time is running short. It's important. Though the exhibitions show you what you already know, they want you to be sure to remember. Look at the display of instruments of torture. Portraits show how they were used. How the prisoners were starved, shackled, whipped, clubbed, beaten, waterboarded, their nails extracted, stung by scorpions and insects, poisonous insects. Awful, so don't stop. Continue on to the last room. It's one you'll never forget. There was a large memorial stupa, skull and bone and cases to either side. With more time, you might have even seen one of the locals light three sticks of incense. No need to know why. The last stop is the museum, the last official one at least. I noticed a souvenir shop outside. A series of portraits show how the victims were killed. In one, a perpetrator bashes a baby against a tree while a comrade drags the mother away. In another, a bare-chested perpetrator has thrown a child upwards, raised his bayonet, readied himself to skewer the infant on the way down. In anticipation, his comrade watches. On the ground before them is a mass of hair, flesh, and blood. Still another portrait shows a line of captives, blindfolded, cuffed, necks notched on a string of rope, being marched in line. A second photograph shows what happens. A Paul Potus is clubbing a prisoner in the back of the head at the mouth of a mass grave. In the pit below, another perpetrator cuts the throat of a prisoner. The two portraits are painted in muted hues with overcast twilight skies. On the wall above them hangs a large black and white photograph of a real-life mass grave, a small pond filled with water, skull, and bones. Turn, look at the wall. A map of Cambodia is the final thing you're meant to see. It's made out of bones and skulls, rivers running red. The skulls face forward, dark sockets staring, an accusation. This is Cambodia during the savage Pol Pot regime. Remember, bear witness, never forget. And I don't have time to read more, so I'll stop. Well, I think I've lost the, the flow. I mean, I, I can go on for another three or four minutes if you want. It's, uh, of sure. course. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Please. All right. Okay. Ellipsis 2, Justice Tour. The Tool Slang Museum of Genocidal Crimes, 2009, unfinished. Open and shut your eyes three times. It will help your eyes adjust, because outside the sun is blazing. Step forward, pass through the doorway. Move forward from darkness into the light. Things look different. Shall we leave now? Here's the path, the sign pointing to the exit. An ellipsis. Oh look, see that Cambodian man, the one with the mustache who's lying on the bench over there, close to that small monument? I've met him before. His name is Uncle Son, and he's a survivor. He's traveled here from a distant Cambodian village with a friend, Auntie Yan. In the countryside, they use names like that. It's tradition. Would you like me to introduce you to him? Great, let's go. Yes, now that we're close, I see that he is dozing. Look, he's frowning, and his eyeballs are moving like he's having a dream. Uncle San, an older Cambodian woman, Auntie Yan is her name, is waking him. Get up, you have a visitor. The archaeologist is back and he's brought someone. Uncle San slowly opens his eyes and sits up, the expression of frown, lips pressing into a flat line, then a small smile. Hello, he says. My name is Uncle San. Would you like to hear my story? Yes, I know you're nervous. Doing so might upset him. But don't you want to know? Auntie Yan is here with him, and can help if there's a problem. Let's tell him yes, shall we? He begins again. Hello, my name is Son. I'm 64 years of age. I live in a village in Siem Reap province. I have lived in this village since I was young, but during the Khmer Rouge regime, I was forced to live in another area. A pause, and then he continues, as if turning the page. During the Khmer Rouge regime, I was forced to dig right, plant rice all day. He tells us next. Once I took a crab from a field and was beaten for doing so. I remember my mistreatment of monks, hard work, poor food, tortures, and killings. When it was over and I went back to my village, my home was destroyed. He closes his eyes and leans back, hands behind his head, fingers locked. He is frowning again. 
What makes me most sad of all is that my own family members were killed. Since then, I have bad dreams every night about what happened. Another pause. Yes, I'm worried as well. Maybe we should ask him to stop before he gets too upset. He goes on before we can decide. Usually, he explains, sitting upright again. I try not to think about the past by spending my time planting rice, going to the pagoda, and chatting with my neighbors. Do you see his traditional Cambodian scarf, the one slung over his shoulder, like a sash? It looks so elegant, as if he's a wise man. Auntie Yan is my neighbor, Uncle San says as he takes a sip from his cup of tea. I have known her since I was a child. Her family was killed during the Khmer Rouge regime. We often eat and drink tea together. We should ask her to tell us her story as well. Yes, I know it's upsetting. He's clearly traumatized. And I guess you can guess what happened to her. Let's say thanks and go. Besides, there's a booklet that tells his story. I've read it before and can tell you everything. But you can fill in the blanks. We walk away, Uncle San and Auntie Yan fading away, until they are two black dots in the distance. There's just one thing. How could you understand what they were saying? Were they speaking English? No, then who was translating? Auntie Yan, do you recall? I'm in another break point. I could keep going on a long time. Thank you so much. Thank you. So our third speaker is Mark Gottlieb. His topic is the tobacco industry's mass production of doubt and denial. <laughs> Uh, kids 
that are alive today that will um, ultimately die from a smoking-related cause um, in the United States. And we've got 16 million people currently um, uh, suffering from uh, smoking-related disease in the U.S. And it's very expensive, too. Um, so the manufactured cigarette um, is you know, a relatively new phenomenon. It, it didn't really exist until the very late 19th and early 20th century. Um, in 1900, there were only 140 known cases of lung cancer that were uh, in uh, the medical literature. Um, in one uh, um, story told by a, a thoracic surgeon and lung cancer researcher, um, Alton Oshner, um, he uh, indicated that, uh, said that in 1919, his entire junior medical school class was summoned to witness uh, the autopsy of a, uh, a patient who died from lung cancer because it was so rare they might never get to see such a, uh, 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 this disease and its effect on the body again. But that was not to be. Uh, as you can see in this slide, I don't know if you can see it um, very well, but um, starting in around 1900, where you had almost uh, no cases of lung cancer and a very low uh, cigarette smoking rate, um, you have about a 20 year lag and almost an exact mirror of the rates of lung cancer with the rates of cigarette consumption. Um, so that's a pretty similar trend, I'd say. Um, okay, press the wrong button now. There we go. Um, and this was really made possible um, because of the, um, um, the automation of uh, cigarette manufacture. Uh, James uh, uh, Bonsack uh, sold his uh, um, cigarette machine to, um, to um, James Buck Duke, who uh, ended, up, ended up starting the R.J. Reynolds, the American Tobacco Company, which later became the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, and Philip Morris, and Lorillard after it was all split up by the uh, Supreme Court in a uh, decision the same year that the, um, that the oil industry was, um, was broken up into uh, its major companies, interestingly enough, by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, but the, uh, uh, the Bonsack machine, here's an early uh, uh, model of one, uh, was able to uh, basically produce um, uh, what 60 skilled cigarette rollers uh, and workers could, could produce in, uh, in an hour. Uh, and that revolutionized the, made it, uh, the, the possibility of mass manufacture of, of cigarettes um, possible. And then we see this emerging trend with lung cancer going on. Um, by 1949, a uh, landmark study by Sir Richard Dahl and Bradford Hill, um, who were working for the National Health Service uh, in, uh, in England, uh, and were tracking all the cases of lung cancer because they noticed this rapid increase in lung cancer. Um, they uh, tracked down uh, all 647 cases of lung cancer that were in the uh, National Health System. Um, in 1949, and interestingly, all 647 of the patients were cigarette smokers. And that was a landmark study in the British Medical Journal, um, but people really hadn't quite gotten, uh, it hadn't broken through to the public at all. People were, I think, aware that um, smoking might not be good for your health. They felt irritation, they heard smoke people with smokers cough, they hadn't really made the lung cancer connection. Um, but in the early 1950s, when 60% of males were smoking, some reassurance was needed, and so um, that the uh, R.J. Reynolds Company relied on the, um, on, on the um, medical community for that in their advertising. And let's see if I can make this happen. How often does your job call you out of bed in the middle of the night? Well, if you were a doctor, it would be often. And generally, there isn't much time to spare. Coffee, Doctor? Oh, fine. I don't care what you're talking. Thanks. You know, this night works kind of rough, isn't it? That's right. But a camel is always a pleasure. Yes, folks, the pleasing mildness of a camel is just as enjoyable to a doctor as it is to you or me. In a nationwide survey, doctors in all branches of medicine were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? <laughs> the answer most was camels. Tens of thousands of doctors, general practitioners, surgeons, specialists, 
Doctors in every branch of medicine were included. And according to this nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarettes. Try camels yourself. And in the 1950s, uh, the uh, cigarette companies were trying to recruit more women uh, smokers. Women uh, were smoking at a rate uh, in the uh, early 50s at about 25%, uh, and they were hoping to get closer to 50% uh, with women uh, as well. But there was still the same uh, concerns that, that they had to address uh, around um, potential health issues uh, with uh, the women smokers they were trying to recruit. I lost it. Let's see. Go back here. There we go. Something wonderful happened. <laughs> when you change to third part, you'll feel better. Did you say I'll feel better smoking to the Yes, you'll feel better. And here are reasons why. In case after case, coughs due to smoking disappear. A parched throat clears up. That stale, smoked out feeling vanishes. That is wonderful. When you change to Philip Morris, you really taste your cigarette once again. The clear, clean taste of fine mellow tobacco. And your food will taste better, too. But why do these wonderful things happen when I change to Philip Morris? Because you'll be smoking the one cigarette with a difference in manufacture. An important difference that avoids a common cause of cigarette irritation. Day after day, you'll be smoking these cigarettes recommended by eminent nose and throat specialists to patients who smoke. The one cigarette proved definitely milder than any other leading brand. This all came crashing down on the cigarette companies starting in December of 1952 uh, when the Reader's Digest, which is one of the few publications that didn't take uh, cigarette advertising dollars, um, published a piece by Ray Knorr called Cancer by the Carton, which um, described and summarized um, the um, key uh, research uh, linking cigarette smoking to lung cancer um, to date. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, a publication, uh, a, a, an article was uh, published rather in Cancer Research by Ernst Winder, uh, along with his, uh, with co his colleagues Graham and Croninger, um, with, in which they took the tar from uh, cigarette smoke and, um, and painted it on the backs of mice, and lo and behold, those mice grew tumors. Um, and in Time Magazine, uh, Winder said that uh, um, in 1953, uh, this shows conclusively that there is something in cigarette smoke which can produce cancer. It is no longer merely a possibility. Our experiments have proved it beyond any doubt. This was actually uh, a, a huge news, and every news outlet, and uh, there's uh, you know, uh, hundreds of, of uh, newspaper articles uh, and uh, television stories were covering this potential link between excessive cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Um, and sales of cigarettes were dropping, and the cigarette companies needed to decide what to do about it. So. Uh, they got together at the Plaza Hotel, the uh, CEOs of uh, all the major cigarette companies in the U.S., uh, with the exception of Liggett, I believe, because the uh, CEO of Liggett thought this would all blow over and didn't need to attend this meeting. Uh, but they met at the uh, uh, Plaza Hotel in uh, December of 1953 and convened a strategy meeting um, to formulate an uh, industry-wide unified response to the public's anxiety generated by the negative publicity about the direction of scientific research on cigarettes and cancer, and also to what they accurately understood to be a major threat to their corporation's economic future. And uh, this is a quote from the U.S. v. Philip Morris decision by federal judge Jed, um, Gladys Kessler. Um, oh, yeah. And so they came back and met again, and they hired Hill and Knowlton. Remember them? Uh, in, uh, in December of 1953. Uh, and Hill and Knowlton proposed that the companies form a joint industry research committee that would sponsor independent scientific research on the health effects of smoking, and then announce it in, uh, in um, news and advertisements. So they formed what they called the Tobacco Industry Research Committee. 
Um, and the first thing that the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, uh, uh, the, the way they heralded the formation of, of, of the committee was to place a full page ad in over 1,000 uh, U.S. newspapers in January of 1954, uh, which is called uh, a frank statement to cigarette smokers. Um, and, uh, you know, they say recent reports on experiments with mice have uh, given wide publicity to a theory that cigarette smoking is in some way linked with lung cancer in human beings. Uh, at the same time, we feel it is in the public interest to call attention to the fact that eminent doctors and research scientists have publicly questioned the claimed significance of these experiments. Distinguished authorities point out that medical research in recent years indicates many possible causes of lung cancer. There's no agreement among authorities regarding what the cause is. There's no proof that cigarette smoking is one of the causes. This is a frank statement. And uh, that statistics <laughs> reporting to link cigarette smoking with the disease could apply with equal force to any uh, one of many aspects of modern life. Indeed, the validity of the statistics themselves is questioned by numerous scientists. They go on to say, we accept an interest in people's health as a basic responsibility paramount to every other concern in our business. And they went on to announce the formation of this um, research committee of distinguished scientists, but um, don't let me uh, tell you about it. Um, let's, let's hear it from the horse's mouth. <laughs> it's Timothy D. Hartnett, former president of a major tobacco firm and chairman of the Industry Research Committee. And tomorrow, I would like to quote from the statement released at the time the Tobacco Industry Research Committee was formed. At that time, we stated, we accept an interest in people's health as a basic responsibility paramount to every other consideration in our business. And that's where we stand today. I would like to emphasize that the industry has assured the Scientific Advisory Board individually and collectively of complete freedom of action. We have extended the same freedom of action to investigators who are free to present their findings or publish their findings without clearance or prior approval from this board. The distinguished scientist, Dr. Clarence Cook Little, director of the Jackson Memorial Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine, agreed to serve as our scientific director. Needless to say, uh, maybe it is needless to say, that um, freedom of action that they guaranteed the scientists um, wasn't actually given uh, the scientists uh, um, uh, that, that they selected um, needed to clear any sort of uh, publication uh, with the Tobacco Industry Research Council. Judge Kessler in U.S. v. Philip Morris describes it thusly, it served as a sophisticated public relations unit for the defendants especially in relation to growing public concern about the risk of smoking by repeatedly attacking scientific studies that demonstrated the harms of cigarette smoke and insisting on the notion of an open question regarding cigarette smoking and health. Yes. With the crea creation of the, the TIRC in 1954, the defendants established a sophisticated public relations vehicle based on the premise of conducting independent scientific research to deny the harms of smoking and reassure the public. That essential strand of their long-range strategy was developed and implemented in 1953 and 54 and guided their activities for more than 40 years. Um, in 1958, the Tobacco Industry Research Council split into two entities, the Council for Tobacco Research, which was the, um, uh, which, yes, coordinated the, uh, um, the grants and research uh, of the, uh, the, the, they were uh, the independent research they were conducting. Um, however, cigarette company lawyers and the CEOs chose what would be funded. Um, and based on internal documents, uh, you see this, uh, Washington, this Los Angeles Times piece, the favorite scientists got the tobacco firm funding um, through the um, Council for Tobacco Research. And then they also, the other entity was the Tobacco Institute, uh, which became the public relations arm of the, uh, of the cigarette industry. But then, another bombshell hit 50 years ago um, when uh, the first uh, Surgeon General's report was uh, released in January of 1964. It is the judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and 
to the overall death rate. This was a real change because now the U.S. government has taken a formal position uh, and it became more challenging for the cigarette companies to, um, to deny the scientific link, but they continued to do so. They doubled down on their efforts. Uh, the Tobacco Institute um, uh, created, issued, disseminated press releases, public statements, advertisements, brochures, pamphlets, and other written materials denying that there was any link between smoking disease, that nicotine was addictive, that the companies marketed to youth, or that secondhand smoke posed any health risk, and discrediting scientists and public health officials who took a different position on the issues. So, how does the, did the uh, cigarette companies manufacture denial? Volume, volume, volume. Cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. It may not be. We just don't know. I don't know. Frankly, I think that smoking may be hazardous. It may not be. Smoking may be hazardous. It may not be. Including TV knows for certain. It may be or it may not be. We don't know. I don't know what harms a cigarette smoker or what doesn't harm you. I don't know if cigarettes are bad or not bad. We don't know what causes <laughs> the elements that have been attributed to cigarette smoking. I am saying that the science to date and over a hundred million dollars of our industry indicates that there is no causal link. So you must be trying to get me to admit that cigarette smoking is harmful. For me, I am not denying the fact that cigarette smoking could be a risk factor involved with some people. Uh, you know, what we know is that Bradley runs through the bar patch. Put your arm from the look back and see which price stuff. That's that's incredible. And it was at the time. These were companies that had a very different reputation than they do now. Um, but they really, really, really did know. Um, in a, a, a document uh, by uh, chief scientist for R.J. Reynolds to uh, vice president of the company Claude Teague in 1964. Uh, the uh, scientist Alan Rodgman says, since it is now well established that cigarette smoke does contain several polycystic aromatic hydrocarbons, and considering the potential and actual carcinogenic activity of a number of these compounds, a method of either complete removal or almost complete removal of these compounds from smoke is required. Yet, um, uh, seven years later, the chairman of Philip Morris uh, faced the nation um, indicated it acted like this was not known to the company at all. Uh, because when, as and if, any ingredient in cigarette smoke is identified as being injurious to human health, we are confident that we can eliminate that ingredient. When and when? When was uh, quite some time earlier. Um, British American Tobacco sent a, uh, a group of their scientists to the U.S. to talk about this issue with uh, North American uh, tobacco scientists and executives in 1958, and uh, they found a consensus among North American uh, tobacco industry scientists and, uh, and executives, and they, in their report, said, with one exception, the individual with whom we met believed that smoking causes lung cancer, if by causation we mean any chain of events which leads finally to lung cancer, which involves smoking as an indispensable link. And this is 1958. It really, really knew. Um, Fred Panzer, oh, I've got five seconds. Fred Panzer wrote, um, <laughs> uh, it has always been, and he was uh, 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 a, um, at R.J. Reynolds, it has always been a holding strategy consisting of creating doubt about the health charge without actually denying it. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, let um, the chief scientific uh, director of Philip Morris uh, talk a little bit about applesauce as I go over time. None of the things which have been found in tobacco smoke are at concentrations which can be considered harmful. But the components themselves can be considered harmful, can they not? Anything can be considered harmful. Applesauce is harmful if you get too much of it. <laughs> I don't think many people are dying from applesauce. They weren't eating that much. People are smoking a lot of cigarettes. Well, I would you say it this way. The people who eat applesauce die. The people who eat sugar die. Uh, the people who smoke cigarettes die. Does the fact that the people who smoke cigarettes die demonstrate that smoking is the cause? Wow. <sighs> And um, they uh, 
in addition to appearing on the news and information programs, the Tobacco Institute also produced their own uh, television ads uh, to get their viewpoint across. Here in Washington, a lot goes on that you never hear about. Take the controversy about cigarettes. In the 91st Congress, a House committee heard testimony from leading experts on smoking and health. The record shows that many of the country's most respected doctors openly challenge anti-cigarette claims. A California doctor said, as a scientist, I find no persuasive evidence that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. A New York doctor told Congress, to claim there is now sufficient scientific evidence to establish that cigarette smoking causes disease it is, in my opinion, unjustified. There is another side to the cigarette controversy. It's all here in this white paper. Central. Would you be surprised to find out that the doctors he is uh, quoting uh, actually received money from the cigarette companies? <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I think they would have possibly gotten away with it, except that things changed dramatically uh, in 1994. Um, uh, yes, uh, you've probably all seen uh, these bits before. I'd like you to rise, and those who will be so specifying as well. The CEOs of the uh, tobacco companies in 1994 at the... Uh, in testifying the, uh, in Congress from Waxman's committee. Raise your right hand. You swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please consider yourself to be under oath. Let me uh, begin my questioning on the matter of uh, whether or not nicotine is addictive. Let me ask you first, I'd like to just go down the road, uh, whether each of you believes uh, that nicotine is not addictive. I heard Virtually all of them touch on it. Just yes or no. Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. toxic. We'll, we'll take that as a no, and again, time is short. If you could just, I think each of you believe <laughs> nicotine is not addictive, we just would like to have this for the record. <laughs> I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I do believe that nicotine is not addictive. This was quite a moment in where they exceeded plausible deniability and were derided by the public by uh, the you know, monologues, by late night talk show hosts, um, by stand up comedians, by just about everyone. Uh, and it was a, a, a huge story at the time. So a whole bunch of denial disruptors came together in 1994. Um, time's over. Uh, you got David Kessler in the FDA um, sending a, a, a letter saying that uh, provisions of the FDA uh, could ultimately uh, result in removal from the market of tobacco products containing nicotine at levels that could cause or satisfy addiction. Uh, you have uh, a huge cache of internal documents that were leaked uh, in a, uh, a box that was marked Mr. Butts uh, that resulted in an entire issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1995, analyzing the documents, later the cigarette papers, and later a depository with over 40 million pages of documents in uh, Minnesota. Um, You've got, and then you've got class actions, secondhand smoke lawsuits, individual lawsuits, and then the state lawsuits all bearing down on the tobacco industry at the same time that whistleblowers and the insiders were coming out of the woodwork and saying, uh, talking about what they knew was going on. And it really all came crashing down for the industry at that time. U.S. v. Philip Morris was the uh, racketeering uh, case under the RICO Act um, that uh, went on for about nine years and resulted in a finding that the cigarette companies were in fact liable under civil RICO. Um, and uh, um, I, they, they are now fighting, in, uh, one more time, uh, the uh, putting uh, corrective statements, um, which are ordered by the court, uh, in, in newspapers, at points of purchase, and on uh, television and radio. Those will sound something like this when they, uh, when they come out.
A federal court has ruled that Altria, R.J. Reynolds Tobacco, Lorillard, and Philip Morris USA deliberately deceived the American public about the health effects of smoking and has ordered those companies to make this statement. Here is the truth. Smoking kills, on average, 1,200 Americans every day. More people die every year from smoking than from murder, AIDS, suicide, drugs, car crashes, and alcohol combined. Smoking causes heart disease, emphysema, acute myeloid leukemia, and cancer of the mouth, esophagus, larynx, lung, stomach, kidney, bladder, and pancreas. Smoking also causes reduced fertility, low birth weight in newborns, and cancer of the cervix. They are particularly eager to uh, pay to uh, run those ads on television across the country and are still fighting under uh, First Amendment grounds to uh, avoid doing that. It looks like they are going to lose that battle, but it's, uh, that's not over yet. Um, but here they are at this point where they they're, um, can no longer manufacture doubt, and in fact they are going to have to confess publicly uh, to what they've done. Sorry I went a little over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have now uh, time, approximately 50 minutes. Uh, I will keep very short my remarks. It's only an additional information for you, uh, maybe as a surprise for a lot of you. Uh, as we saw from the papers, uh, changing knowledge increasing knowledge and the public pressure uh, develop different political strategies to deal with the denial and I have a new information for you from Turkey today according to Turkish newspapers Etienne Mahçupyan, one of my friends uh, who uses the term genocide very oftenly and wrote extensively on it also in his column he was appointed by Turkish Prime Minister as Chief Advisor and for the democratization process of Turkey, Etienne Mahçupyan is an Armenian from intellectual from Turkey. And uh, according to other information, which I cannot confirm yet, uh, especially for the Turkish-Armenian issue, it is the Halil Bakhtay, the professor from Sabancı University, who also the second person after me openly acknowledged the genocide in Turkey and worked very hard in the recognition of genocide in Turkey at least. Now he is also in charge of, in name of the government, to deal with Turkish-Armenian uh, relations, issues. So, so this is an interesting development. It's a new strategy and this is, it, it gives us a lot of stuff to talk and to discuss. So now I open the floor, uh, please, your questions. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Hinton. Thank you for it. I'm Sarah Brown. I just presented. I have a question for Dr. Hinton um, regarding, I'm going to call it genocide tourism, uh, which is something that uh, takes place in Rwanda when tourists come to Rwanda. They come to see the gorillas, or they come to go to Nyugwe Rainforest, or they go to Akagera, maybe. But everybody stops at the Kigali Genocide Memorial. And while sometimes it veers on this kind of uh, crass tourism, at the same time, it's educational and it's a step towards educating people who would otherwise be coming just to see gorillas. They, they're, they're also now uh, learning something about historical facts uh, regarding the, the genocide against the Tutsi. In Cambodia, do you have a similar sense? Is, there, is it educational? Is it, is it being misused or abused? Where is it based on your talk? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I forgot to mention that last night, very late, I snuck into the room and I put up a big sign in the back. It's the message of my uh, my talk. Oh. Very, very late at night. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little bit of jet lag from going from one, so I got it up late. Um, but in other words, so my, my concern isn't to make a prescriptive judgment about yes or no. In terms of all that stuff is going on in different ways. What I'm trying to do is how is the site being seen? How is it being used? What sorts of statements about the truth does it tell and what doesn't it tell? So it, I don't want to go too much into the different literary techniques, but part of it's set up to contrast the, the messaging that was going on under the People's Republic of Cappuccino regime, which hopefully came through in the way I was reading text. And the whole thing's supposed to 
disrupt, even as it asserts a linear narrative. So it's sort of predicated on that. And then to juxtapose at the end with the way it's now, people are seeing the tribunal. So it, the shift from the imperative in the first part of it to the second part, where suddenly the question is going to the person who you're reading to, asking, do you want to versus you must, that's a manifestation of human rights discourses. So at the same site, it's being used completely differently to assert different truths. And I think it's important to, to note, you know, earlier justice has been brought up um, and sort of the historical truth that comes from justice. Yeah, you know, that's true, but it's also a certain sort of truth. And I can give you, in terms of the tribunal, a very specific example. Uh, as with all courts, when courts are created, they get their jurisdiction. Part of that jurisdiction is personal, part of it's temporal. In the case of the Cambodian court, the temporal jurisdiction is 1975 to 1979. If you're one of the objectives of a court, as often says, to render the truth, well, what happens when the story you tell can only be told during the period of Khmer Rouge rule and can't touch upon any of the preceding events or any of the events that took place afterwards? What happens when the jurisdiction locates and fixes, fixes the attention on Cambodia as opposed to geopolitical situations. So in other words, so yeah, so there are lots of good things that emerge out of tribunals. Uh, but the truth that's being generated is a partial one. You know, you look at the photographs around here in black and white, right, it's all shadow and light. So we get a frame, we see certain things, and we don't see things, and the same thing at the memorial. So I'm trying to draw out a questioning of what we're seeing, pointing towards what we're not seeing, you know, and that's why with the path and different I'm sorry, I answered too long. So it's being used for education, but the question for me becomes, how is it being used for education? Not to say, yes, no, good, bad, but how is it being used? And the paper, well, I don't know if I can call it a paper, but the, the narrative goes on and moves to a classroom. This part I'm going to write, we're, a, we're an outreach initiative is being undertaken, but that's, that's the unfinished part. I'm sorry, I spoke for too long. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'd like to, uh, my name is Emma Francis Bloomfield. Um, I'd like to put Jennifer and Mark in conversation with one another for a second, because I think the vocabulary you're offering, Jennifer, is really valuable and useful in talking about um, how we're looking at norms and responses to them. And But I'm wondering if it's not reductionist to say this is only happening in terms of these international norms. So it appears to me that the Tobacco Research Institute is, nor is an example of norm signaling. And can we expand your vocabulary to not just international norms of law? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think probably. Um, in the paper, uh, I, I, I kind of conceptualized this broad term rhetorical adaptation and then the, the specific types. And um, because I just have a single case study in the paper, so I, I, over time I, I map the shifts in the content of these two norms and then I map um, the ways in which Turkish rhetoric um, shifts in parallel with some of the shifts in, in these international norms. So I, I, I limit my claims to international norms, but I suspect that the concepts would travel, yeah. You know, starting around the year 2000, um, Philip Morris used a term um, to describe how they were trying to um, change the perception of, of, of their company and their industry, and the term they used was societal alignment. They had a societal alignment initiative, which was um, bilateral in that they wanted to show that they were um, that they were being responsible. They were saying that uh, you know now we know that you know that we agree with the Surgeon General's reports, blah blah blah. But they also had a um, a uh, um, corporate social responsibility component to um, um, actually sort you do a little revisionist history as well. Um, so they were trying to change perceptions of them uh, using both both means. And I think this kind of resonates with, uh, with what you were talking about, certainly. Yes, others? Yes, Tom. Um, just a very minor point, um, but I remember Chris Simpson uh, from American University back in 2001 did a really interesting presentation and I, if I remember correctly, it was on Senator Robert Byrd, um, and he put in parallel his advocacy for the tobacco industry and his denial of the Armenian genocide. And you see sort of the same sort of actor in, in, in both sort of denial campaigns. So just something to make a connection. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was, Brock, uh, I was 
thinking about while we were making our presentation, the genetically modified food debate that is currently going on, in which the tables are sort of turned against science, but you know, in the, there, there is no evidence that uh, genetically modified food is uh, actually bad for your health, but there is this strong doubt in the society that it is actually bad, and you know, Monsanto is paying people. So, is, do you think the experience in this debate is shaped by the whole tobacco industry uh, thing that we, the society went through? And if, if not, uh, do you think because there is just doubt inherent in science that this type of debate is always, you know, there is always susceptibility that this is how the debate will be shaped as long as there is like outside incentives on to your device? I mean, it certainly seems to me that companies like Monsanto are using some of the tactics and taking um, uh, ideas from the playbook that the tobacco industry uh, used. And they're doing it as a prophylactic measure at this point. There, there, there isn't this body of, of, of evidence that they're trying to cover up or create doubt around, but they're going to do it anyway, um, just in case. Um, and, uh, you know, and, but there is, as you say, you know, I think a lot of, of people are concerned or have lingering concerns around um, the idea of, of, uh, of GMO products. Um, and so maybe it's, it's to, uh, to uh, take the bull by the horns and, uh, and you know, get out in front of it. Um, and they, they are certainly taking some very aggressive steps. Yes. If I may briefly add, what, what I was trying to say was, you know, we, there is no actual scientific evidence. And, you know, while Monsanto might be paying these uh, scientists, it's not an old, like, Monsanto can't be paying all scientists right. who are studying GMOs. So maybe we're trying to be rational today towards GMOs' health effects, but because of our experience in the tobacco industry, we're actually being irrational. And, you know, denial and doubt is actually, it's, it's a reversal of, I'm, I'm I sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, 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 that's a really good observation. Um, and, and we may, there may be a prejudice um, in, or a, 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 a bias against companies like Monsanto because of the, the um, and because they're acting in, in ways that, that kind of look similar to what the tobacco industry was doing. But they may not actually um, um, have uh, a, a whole body of science that they need to undermine. Science may, is actually on their side. It's very interesting. Jennifer, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I actually have a question that I just would sort of pose maybe uh, to, to, to get us to keep thinking, maybe no one, you don't have to answer it now, but, but just as I'm um, hearing about um, uh, rhetoric and denial in different realms about different topics, uh, one question I'm thinking about as a political scientist are, 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 are what are the mechanisms um, that uh, might plausibly connect these things or are there, are there not explicit connections? So one thing I'm thinking about is, is I think coming from your question, Brock, is is um, are, do we see any instances of policy learning? So 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 Mark drew all these pol um, parallels. But one thing I wondered through Mark's talk was was um, do we have explicit examples that we can identify of um, of, of policymakers or elites um, or PR representatives um, learning from one um, campaign or one issue and, and, and implementing strategies in another realm, or do we have something more along the lines of what I talk about in my paper, which is basically that there's a there's a there's a structure of rhetoric that's acceptable and ideas that are acceptable and um, and that actors are constrained by that structure of existing rhetoric, either domestically or internationally, and therefore respond to these constraints um, and attempt to shape narratives, and that we just that, that parallels arise because the structure is the same, or are there other mechanisms? I'm just wondering. Okay, it's not a yeah, 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 no, I think it's, that's, 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 that's a, a fascinating, um, um, idea, and I think that maybe, in, in terms of the first, that I don't know if it's, it's these, these the le policy lessons are are necessarily being um, learned and and conveyed by elites, but they certainly are uh, learned and used by um, it, it, by attorneys who are um, who are trying to uh, who are concerned about future liability. And I think that's one place where those lessons are, 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 are really uh, taken and then used. And often those, 
those legal concerns drive the public relations campaigns um, to shape um, to, sh to shape attitudes, um, which then can affect sort of the norms. So I, I, yes. sometimes it comes not, not just from from elites, but also but from um, the corporate counsel. <laughs> yes. But my point actually follows up on the question that you just asked about, as we seek in the academic forum to find parallels or, as you say, how could you apply learnings from one situation to another, I think we need to make a very important distinction in the issue of the Armenian genocide denial of who the speaker is. You have the political state, the perpetrator state, engaged in the campaign of denial. That's a very different operation than a, a tobacco company or even individual denial of genocide because of the power and the ability of the state to establish orthodoxy and also to have uh, really the consequences out of the position it took. Maybe the post parallels when a certain general gets on board and says, well, cigarette smoking is dangerous. So we can't equate, even though the language might be useful in the analysis, we cannot equate denial by a perpetrator state with uh, you know, a company or even an individual denial because the importance and the potential of influencing and establishing orthodoxy by the state apparatus. Yes, of course. Uh, I completely agree with you. Um, and the, the other thing I would say is that not only do we have to, pay, to be attentive to, to variations in, in who the actors are that are, that are that are creating and disseminating rhetoric, but we also need to be attentive to um, the intended audience for, for rhetoric. Um, and that I think sometimes um, the same actor can, can craft rhetoric um, targeting different audiences. You know, so I was talking about rhetoric aimed at responding to international norms. Um, and, and in some cases, um, the Turkish government's rhetoric differs for domestic audiences than it does for international audiences. Luan? Um, I think it's important to note the role of the, the professional communicator here, because both governments and corporations use professional communicators. Um, the Hill and Knowlton firm, for example, has come up a couple of times. I'm sure that Mark can tell us a lot more about Hill and Knowlton if he wants to. Um, I also want to point out that historically, the um, evolution of modern public relations comes out of World War I. It gets started in the 1920s. Um, the main figure in that is a man named Edward Bernays. I'm sure you know that name, right? right? He was the first person to call himself public relations counsel. Um, and, and so public relations is something that seeks to influence social norms, and, but it also responds to social norms because at a certain point, the cost of reputation management just gets too high. Mm -hmm. So Bernays himself is a good case study on this. Um, he, in the 1920s and 30s, he was a promoter of tobacco companies. He's credited with making it socially acceptable for women to smoke in public. Torches but, of Freedom. Yeah, yeah, the Torches of Freedom campaign. Yeah. The whole idea of establishing front groups, that was his innovation. Yeah. You know? And so when you have strategies that work in one campaign, if you're a professional counsel, you can use them in other campaigns. There is that learning. However, it's interesting that I, I was very struck by what you said, Mark, about what happened in 1964, right, when the U.S. government got on board. Suddenly the cost of reputation management gets yeah. very, very high. And Bernays, according to his biographer, apparently, um, came up with a plan to make it socially unacceptable to smoke in public. You know, so he was thinking ahead that way. So what's considered to be antisocial can change. Those norms can change, and a, P and a PR professional has to, you know, has to to change with that. So it, it really is a cycle. Brent. So I want to go back to uh, the question. And, and that you gave uh, a moment ago because I think it's an important one. Um, if we're interested in studying denial, it's of course important to document the denial itself, right? Whether at the elite level or in terms of who believes it. Um, but it's also important, I think, to, to be careful to not just focus only on denial because then we can't understand what actually causes it, okay? And I really like Jennifer's paper in the sense that she's, she's following how denial changes, right? The form it takes in Turkey, how that's responding to external causal forces. And the risk we run if we only study cases of denial is we can't differentiate causes. Let me give you an example. There's a very famous study in our field of suicide bombings that attributed them to occupations of the countries where the suicide bombings come from. Okay. The problem is 
Um, they only look at suicide bombers. They don't look at all the people who don't become suicide bombers. Okay. And the fallacy of that reasoning, an easy example is, if you take a bunch of people who died recently and you try to understand why they died, what's one factor they would all have in their system? Water, right? Um, so you've got the, the probability equation backwards. And so what we need to do is think about the cases where denial isn't happening, as well as where it is. The industries that aren't responding the way smoking did, as well as the ones that are, or the countries that aren't responding the way some of these countries are. Right? And think about those comparison cases um, and where denial is happening or not, whether it's being manufactured or not, and then how successful it is. So I guess I just want to push us to bring more of those cases to the table that we haven't really talked about. Uh, GMOs is one, but we haven't we haven't talked about, for instance, countries like. So I'd be interested specifically then in countries that have taken a different tactic or approach. I mean, if you think there are useful points of comparison to Turkey in this case. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. You go first. Um, yeah. No, I, I think that no, it's a very good point. One thing for me again. When you speak about denial, there's one sense in which it's you know, obvious, and everyone's saying, yeah, you know, this is really bad. Right? But it becomes a term also that can be reified, singularized, and essentialized. And I begin to worry sometimes when we speak about that. I, mean, I think you make a very good point of looking at sort of cases of what aren't you seeing to sort of go back to this motif. And again, I become worried when denial becomes this sort of thing that floats that everyone thinks they're sort of talking about the same thing. So when we've been talking about denial, predominantly we've been talking about verbal discourses. Well, so what's left? Okay, so what is the unsaid? What is the tacit? What is the implicit? What is the emotive motive? So there are all sorts of areas that, you know, I think can be brought into the conversation. But to do that, we have to sort of think maybe more about what we mean in terms of denial. And, you know, to go to your question of comparison, to get to the point of doing comparison, to me, you have to sort of interrogate the term before you do a comparison. And then if you sort of take the term denial and you begin to look at different processes, then you look at those dynamics and processes to make the comparison. So I guess my response is more of a methodological, and I see lots of connections, um, but I guess I'm an anthropologist, and methodologically, I, pick, I attune to what's being said, but I also attune to what's not being said. I attune, I look for the bumps, right? The things that don't make sense, the things that are lost in translation versus the straightforward narratives, which you know, they tend to. But, so that's how I would proceed. But I'm an anthropologist. Nobody listens to anthropologists. So. <laughs> I do. I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so, uh, so yeah, I really appreciate your suggestion. Um, in my own research, um, in my broader research from which this is pulled is comparative. So I, have, I, have, um, I compare changes over time in Turkey's narrative, and then I compare changes across um, across two cases, so Turkey's narrative of the Armenian genocide and Japan's narrative of the Nanjing massacre. So I have both within case and cross case comparisons. So um, the, the other thing I would say is, is in my own research, I, my research isn't about denial. It's about um, perpetrator states' narratives of past crimes. Um, and so I actually disaggregate states' narratives um, and come up with kind of a continuum for um, both categorizing states' narratives and then oh, um, it, it, in being able to categorize them, being able to measure change or talk about change over time. So, so I, I agree with Alex's comment as well that, 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 that this category of denial can, can really be um, a ramification that can prevent, um, prevent us from, um, it, it's useful in certain instances, of course, and it's useful for this conference, but that, but that um, if, um, if, if, if I were to just study Turkey's narrative as a narrative of denial, which of course it is a narrative that denies that there was a genocide, but I, I wouldn't be able to acknowledge that there's been any change in the substance of the narrative. And so I, I kind of disaggregate categories um, uh, in my research. Not moving. To Jennifer, to your question about uh, interrelationships, yeah. in what I've been able to in what I've written about, it's limited, for me anyway, based on the access of, of information I have, to mostly parallels. Yeah. Uh, there are certain <laughs> moments where you see places of intersection in certain, some of the going on behind the curtain. Uh, with, with Turkish uh, denial and lobbying and so forth, we have one, I think, the, the, he, the, the famous Heath Lowry memo that was accidentally sent to, to Robert uh, Lipton uh, in, in the 90s. One document that sort of lets us 
peel back and see what's going on behind the scenes. Um, until somebody unloads a lot of documents, or there is a lawsuit that forces these documents into the public view, or, or you know, somebody starts spilling the beans, um, I think it's likely to remain in that situation. Uh, Jennifer, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm a little troubled, not major, that you uh, put a very long period of time into a single category of silence, 1920, 1980, that's 60 years. And my sense is that there, uh, it was a period of su attempted suppression of memory, but it was not always silence. That suppression went through different phases. Already, as you probably know, the Turkish, I think it was the 1950s, uh, Turkish ambassador in Washington is trying to persuade the Americans that what the Ottoman Empire did, or the Turk government did, was no different than what the United States did to the Japanese and the West Coast of the United States. And so, you know, you have to defend yourself, and so, so don't blame us. And, and uh, already in the 1960s, I remember getting a lot uh, from uh, Ankara or Istanbul, a lot of uh, pulp literature, pulp literature which are basically rehashed, badly written, badly translated tracts of denial uh, or, or justification. So you might want to look at that or, or maybe think in terms of you know, there is a progression that is taking place up until the 1980s. Yeah, um, so so for this phase of the 50s and 60s and 70s, I actually categorized it as silencing and denial. Yeah. Um, so not just silencing, although that was what I emphasized here. Right. Um, uh, I found a lot, I found um, articles from the 70s in particular and beginnings of publications of a few books in the 70s, mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't a, a, I kind of traced in my research a real break in 1981, like a systematic reevaluation of both the narrative and a regeneration of efforts to, to disseminate this new narrative. Um, which is not to say that, you know, that there were isolated attempts. Um, I do agree with you. One, two, three. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can't help myself, but I, I have to. Um, I, I want to make a point that uh, let us not forget that the argument um, about GMOs is not just about health impacts. That's an important thing. But there's, in my opinion, maybe even a bigger discussion to be had about food security because many people don't know that Monsanto seeds are modified so that they're not fertile after one year of production, and so. In terms of, if we're, I, I absolutely agree with Alex, if we're singularizing denial, that's problematic because we can look to the, you know, companies like Monsanto and say, well, they're not denying because there's no scientific fact showing health impacts. But what they are doing is quelling discussion about the food security issue. And they've lobbied very, very hard against the passage of a bill that would require them to label products that contain GMOs. Um, so, I just, I agree, and also let us not forget the other part of the GMO discussion. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Jennifer, but I think it also deals with some of the things that Alex uh, was saying. Uh, when you talk about denial aspect and has, how it has changed and evolved, uh, you know, it's, it's clearly, uh, th there's a framework, and I'm suspecting that framework is going to be discussed in, on, on the next panel. So there's a framework that the Turkish state narrative you know, is, is, is following, right? And this, this framework is very fluid because it's also, yes, not, on, not only on the international level, but also on how the Armenians are doing things, right? So, for example, at, at, at a point when Armenians in general are not employing the term genocide, you know, trying to counter the, or using the word genocide in the Turkish context is, is just not a reason to do that. So, uh, in a way, the way we think about denial is, I mean, this, this challenges us to think about denial in a way that it's not as fluid as well. In the sense that in the 1970s or 1980s, what we knew about the Armenian genocide, or the framework we used about the Armenian genocide, and here, like, you know, which has to do more, sometimes it was borrowed from the Holocaust, right? It created a, a narrative, uh, and if you were outside of that, that was denied, right? In, in the 1970s, after that, like in 2000, 2005, right, if you look at that literature and you look at the literature right now, you know, 
some of the scholars, if you go back and ask them, they would say that, you know, this, this scholarship that's coming out in 2010, that's denial of the argument of genocide, right? So I think there's, there's this issue as well. There's, there are several frameworks. And of course, with, the, with scholarship moving forward, right, uh, it's important for us to, to think about denial and, and how, it's, it's, you know, how it's fluid. And you know, scholarship, uh, public intellectuals, and governments are constantly you know, interacting with this and trying to essentially fish whatever uh, you know, interests them or they can react to. Yeah, so I completely agree with you. My, my broader project looks not just at how the state's narrative has responded to international norms, but, but, but to domestic pressures and international pressures and changes in scholarship. Um, and I agree with you that, that in the 1950s, it um, perhaps wouldn't have been so expected for the Turkish government to use the term genocide, given that very few Armenians were using the term genocide. But, but your own research, so I said your research in the paper, I mean, you, you argue that, that Armenians in the diaspora started to use the term genocide um, really after 1965, but we don't see the Turkish government using the term genocide consistently in its rhetoric until the, the early 1980s, you know? So that, that requires some explanation, right? We might expect um, there to have been a, a shift in the rhetoric then, and, and I would argue that, that, that part of it is, is shifts in international pressures, right? The pressure escalated and escalated throughout the 70s that, that led to a change, but, but that also expert understandings of what genocide meant changed, and that that, that's, that was an important thing, that, that the term became more salient in the, in the 1980s than it was in the 1960s. Ken? My question is for Alex. Um, I was really intrigued about your comment about temporal uh, brackets for the tribunal in 1975 to 79, what that does to what was before and after. Um, and so my question concerns denials in the Cambodian context. That is, how have things changed in terms of what can be included? What do you have to politically bracket and set aside for the time being? And what remains excluded from the kind of messaging that specifically targets domestic populations? So I'm thinking of the curriculum of your colleagues in Cambodia have uh, gotten into the national educational system and what can be taught, what is still bracketed, and what is off, off the table until Hun Sen and others are, are out of the picture. So if you could elaborate on how denials, patterns of inclusion and exclusion have changed over the last 10, 15 years, uh, I'd love to hear. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I guess, and also for mentioning the bracket, because of course that's the ellipsis, the one, two, three, the dot, 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 which is always there, but we never often just don't attend to it. It's what is assumed implicit. And so that's always the question, you know, what is the ellipsis that's going on? And so in turn, I mean, so there are multiple sort of answers depending on the temporal frame we're looking at. So if we look at the period, the PRK period, the narrative is one that talks about genocide. So tool slings being created in 1979 directly after uh, a Vietnamese-backed government is installed. Uh, internationally, you know, basically tool slings created uh, to make a claim of legitimacy for the state, but also geopolitically, uh, the international community, and well, I shouldn't say, because that term also is used too broadly, but the United States, um, a lot of people, countries that are lumped in the West, China, Thailand, a lot of Asian countries are coming together uh, and because of geopolitics, right, they don't, they're unhappy that basically the Soviet bloc has now come up against the border of Thailand. Well, what do they do? Well, the first thing is the Khmer Rouge are routed. Uh, they basically are in tatters on the, on the borders. They are done as a fighting force. Uh, so this coalition props them back up. But in 1979, the question becomes, who's going to get Cambodia's seat at the UN? So tool slaying is created, as well as a number of other memorial sites in Cambodia, as a response to make a claim that, look, genocide took place here. These people across the border are being rearmed, right? They're the genocidaires. Uh, while the people who are supporting that say, well, let's give uh, the Khmer Rouge Cambodia's seat at the UN, and that's what happened. Okay, so the word genocide by all the countries after 1993 that begin to use the word genocide, we have the Cambodia Genocide Act of the United States, the word is never used, I mean, it's a vast general to say never, you can always find an exception, but by and large the policy is to say something along the lines of the unfortunate events of the past. That's Diplo speak about it. Okay, so you go through this temporal phase, so you have the creation of the museum, the other thing about the museum is that, you know, the Pol Pot click, 
Well, the members of the current government, as you alluded to, are former Khmer Rouge themselves. And so they create and fashion a narrative of what's happened as it being the Pol Pot, Kusum Pan, Ying Saudi clip. And so they're also doing work that's also putting stuff into the ellipsis. Um, in terms of the, you know, I don't want to go on too long. I, I could speak a long time, so I, I won't. But in terms of the current uh, curriculum, and absolutely, there's certain things that you can say. You know, the question is, you know, is January uh, 6th and 7th, is it a liberation or an occupation? And that's a narrative that goes directly into contemporary politics and is played upon by politicians. And so those sorts of things have to be navigated very carefully. And those things go into the ellipsis. So again, you know, thanks for mentioning the bracket and the ellipsis, but that's for the us crazy anthropologists. What's in the ellipsis is always the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Asya. As I'm Asya from Justice Center, and my only question is for Jennifer, but I'd like to hear all the comments uh, by other uh, panelists. It's about the news that Professor Achum just uh, announced before we started the conversation and the discussion, and. Um, Examining the narrative of Armenian genocide in Turkish state by Turkish state, and uh, knowing also the Ottoman state's history and having um, like, Ar uh, Armenian by religion ministers or parliament uh, members in the Ottoman Empire, and later manufacturing of denial, uh, how would you comment on that news about the appointment of? Uh, um, an uh, Armenian by origin and person who uses Armenian genocide in that position, uh, taking it also into consideration uh, former Prime Minister Erdogan's speech on April uh, 23rd, uh, 2014. And it's 2015 coming next year. I'd be interested to have your opinion on it too, actually. I was going to say, you should be able to answer. I would add something. Yeah, I mean, as a political scientist, I, I, I'm a little wary of predicting. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I would say is that um, uh, a party, when it first came to power, there were indications that perhaps, you know, um, they might be more willing to change the narrative than, than previous actors, and certainly they had less of a kind of, that their interests were different from, from other parties and actors in Turkish politics, um, and, and their legitimacy was not tied up in kind of chemist narratives of the founding of the nation in the way other parties were. So, so there, was a, there was a possibility. But um, despite, you know, we've seen lots of signaling, I think, more signaling in the past 10 years under our party, but, but not so much substantive change in the narrative itself. So um, certain change is possible. Uh, I just, I'm not sure whether I, I would expect it or not. I mean, my answer would be, we should not make a mistake when we talk on denial. We should not talk about the other side, the other, otherness process. And we should not think that there is a one homogeneous brain there, one actor really playing plans and coordinates everything. I think it's a more complex social process. I'll give you one additional example. Today, Turkish textbooks, for example in the schools. Today, in Turkish high schools, even the Armenian children in Istanbul were told that the Armenians are the first national threat to Turkish state. So, it is the same state on the one side appoints Halil Berktay, a scholar almost like myself, talks about genocide as kind of negotiator maybe, for 2015, but at the same time, the same government teaches the entire children in the country that Armenian consists of a national threat to that country. So this is the important part. We should really fluctuate. As you said, Haji, it's really moves from one direction to another. It's not monolithic in that sense. What definitely is going to be, if this all information through, we will have a changing of discourse. I mean, how we are going to talk on Armenian genocide coming years will change totally. Your partner will be Etienne Makchupian and Halil Berta. You have to discuss with them. So this shows that instead of, for, for my understanding, instead of negative discourse that attacking them denialists, you have to develop now a positive discourse in the sense of what it means to overcome and really whether you want the recognition or 
how really you want to reconcile in that country. So this is the important part. You have to develop more a positive discourse. If the discourse changes. With Etienne and Halil, if the information is correct, of course it will change. They will say that, I mean, I don't want to go into detail, but we can <laughs> hold it. Tanner, is there any risk of co-optation where they're bringing them on so that they can muzzle them? I'm just thinking of Samantha Power here in the United States. She can't say repeat these days. And so is there a risk of co-optation? I mean, it could be the entire process could be only a bit, a bit window dressing mm -hmm. to come over 2015. And you can argue in that way, but it won't help to stay there. Then you have to go beyond that, saying that, I mean, you have to have a clear strategy what it means for you to overcome not only denial, what is the ultimate goal. I mean, what we are expecting as those critical individuals, what want we? I mean, whether, for example, should we go the German way or the American way as one alternative? I mean, American way, I mean, with Ali Bertai and uh, Etienne Machupian, the process will come saying that more democracy, let the civil society talk about it, everybody, freedom of speech, we are talking on Armenian genocide is free, what we want more. And uh, there are enough statements made by Etienne Machupian, one more information for you, saying that it is not the business of diaspora to get involved in this issue. His position that is the, an issue between Turkish state and its own Armenian citizens and Armenian government. So we have to have a, another argument against it. So the total discourse will change on that issue. This is what I want to say. Yes. I just want to add a brief uh, footnote. Uh, Halil Bertai wrote two columns after Erdogan's condolences and he was in full support of the condolence text. So, I mean, it doesn't mean anything, just it's a footnote. Samantha and Henry. Um, hi, Samantha Lakin. I'm a first year at the Center uh, working on issues of uh, justice and memorialization in Rwanda. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go off of this idea um, that Professor Akter mentioned, which was about kind of the multiplicity of faces that a state or an actor uh, might have, whereas you have a, an actor who portrays itself in the, to the international community, whatever that means, or international actors in one way, portrays itself on the state level in another way, local level in another way, one way in health, one way in education, et cetera. And I'm wondering um, if you can maybe step out of your fields for a minute to answer this, because I did my master's in my undergrad in political science, uh, Fulbright in history, master's in IR, now here in history. So um, pulling out, but wondering how much um, the international sphere or international actors have been affecting these narratives of denial? How much have local kind of and cultural aspects or psychological aspects that go into what you know survivors um, and victims have faced or the actual technicalities of the violence and moving out kind of in a justice setting have impacted? So local setting have impacted kind of, what are your feelings in your cases about how, whose influence has been where and the manifestations of that. Any response or can we maybe collect others and at the end I'll give you some. Yes. Um, oh, you want to say something? I can. Oh, okay, please. Yes. Um, um, so, so, so uh, my, my book, which I'm finishing revising, um, answers this question, tries to answer this question for my two cases. So, so, so I found that um, international pressures actually uh, has a bigger influence in triggering change than domestic pressures, but that the content of changes are often primarily shaped by domestic actors and domestic political considerations and domestic dynamics. That's a, a very broad political science answer to your question. Um, obviously, I have lots of details in there, but I found that at least in the two cases I look at over time and across the two cases, international pressures um, are more decisive in triggering change. By the book. <laughs> <laughs> Pre-ordering. No, okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, that could be a very, very long answer to that, which mm -hmm. I want to, but I mean, that's a huge, huge question, right? It raises the issue that Hachim mentioned before about temporality and historicity, um, which really you have to address fully and answer it. I guess maybe the very short answer is, you know, for the different people, what's at stake, 
right? So maybe you can start with that point in answering the question. I mean, in terms of international versus domestic, anthropologists, of course, are always thinking, well, you know, attend to the local. And in terms of answering that, you know, one thing might be defining the stakes in certain contexts. So for the tribunal, the international actors can certainly say, hey, we're bringing in a tribunal, we're giving all this money, even as they're erasing their histories, right? And in some sense, you know, for those who like the gift, right? They're giving the classic gift, we will give you justice, but let's not talk about what happened from 1979 when there were international sanctions and Cambodia and so on and so forth through 1993. Um, so again, you know, but maybe just to, as opposed to the super long answer, what's at stake and for whom, and how does that play out, and in what context are those discussions had or not had? I think that's how I would approach it in a longer answer. Henry? Is it okay to comment on the dark side? <laughs> oh, of course. I knew before Mark falls on the floor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, first, I want to say that I think he's actually, you're very different um, in a variety of ways. I think particularly around I mean, it's the perception in the well, but, public. This is what I mean. Yeah, this. but I think in terms of the power relations issue, and, and that's one thing we've touched on in terms of elite uh, manufacturer consent and so forth. Um, that, that one of the issues beyond sort of co-optation um, is the question of who controls the discourse on genocide. And, and I think following I think what both Jennifer and Alex had to say about nuancing the concept of denial and, and recognizing that we don't have an on-off switch, denial, not denial, it's much, much more complicated. And even going beyond that to look at Japan and, and Australia as two particularly good examples where it's also not an issue of, of progressive sort of linear development, but really an oscillation in terms of the levels of denial and the kinds of denial and so forth. So we go back and forth with admission and then, you know, backtracking and so forth. And, and I think the, the issue with someone like Veritai is that we can move away from denial of the Armenian genocide, but if we move toward a sort of control of discourse by a certain group of people with a certain agenda or a certain approach, which, by the way, by advising the Turkish government, this is exactly what I would say to do, is seize control of the genocide narrative, use the word endlessly, but change the sort of discourse in your favor. And that's maybe the concern we have to look at, and, and not just in this case, but in a lot of other cases as well. So, important point. This is uh, maybe a good, maybe closing comment, if there is no other word, because this is exactly the next panel countering denial how and when. So this is maybe we can discuss in it. Yes. I can announce it. Okay, please. Before, before people start applauding. The, uh, <laughs> not for me, but uh, the, at, the lunch is available uh, for attendees at uh, the university center and at several restaurants along Main Street. And at the end of the session, please, participants, stay here and we will adjourn to the Strassler Center for lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much.